Hi, and most welcome to this TP Share webinar. Implant treatment has become a part of everyday dental work. Many patients, though, will be affected from implant diseases. Are they just having bad luck? And what can we improve in our daily work to achieve higher success rate? Uh, I will share with you how to maintain healthy implants and present studies from different parts of the world. I am uh, Michaela von Jeyer, uh, a dentist working here at TP headquarters in Malmö, Sweden. So the upcoming minutes, I will go through this and the main part will be implant maintenance. Uh, please send questions to me during the presentation and I will address them afterwards. Um, I have two screens here uh, and I will look into the screens uh, and not being able to look into a camera during the presentation. So mostly I will have the camera turned off. Uh, I will ask you some questions during, during the presentation, which I will hope you would like to answer. So. Um, so I'll we'll start with the history. Professor Bronemark is the father of modern dental implantology. He was born in the south of Sweden and later he studied medicine at Lund University. So he was a physician. Already in the late 50s, Professor Bronemark was quite well known among researchers and had a good reputation thanks to his studies concerning blood and microcirculation. His PhD became internationally noticed in 19, uh, sorry, in 1956 when he worked in the university city Lund. He noticed that titanium is not rejected by the body, but instead integrates with the surrounding bone tissue. And this was actually discovered by coincidence when he was studying the properties of blood. A small titanium optics observation chamber had been attached to the leg bone of a rabbit in order to enable observation of uh, blood cells and uh, microcirculation. But when he was going to remove the chamber half a year later, it was not possible. It was osseo integrated. However, it took years before Professor Bronemark realized the importance of this. Rumor has it that an incident inspired him to start developing dental implants. Dr. Bronemark worked as a rural doctor and his young nurse had dentures. In some way, her dentures fell out of her mouth under for her very embarrassing forms. He felt so sorry for her and referred her to dental colleagues, but was told there was no way they could help her. In 1965, Professor Bronemark placed titanium screws in Gösta Larsson, his first implant patient. Uh, the screws supported a full bridge in the lower jaw. Professor Bronemark and Gösta Larsson became very good friends and traveled around the world. And when Gösta Larsson passed away in 2006, the implants had been in function for more than 40 years. But of course, the prosthetic construction was replaced several times. Today, implant treatment is a common treatment option when teeth are missing. How many implants are being placed every year then? Uh, no official figures, uh, so hard to guess, but maybe around 20 million implants per year. It was believed that drawbacks were something very rare once an implant was successfully osseointegrated. But during the 80s, studies started to reveal something else. The term periimplantitis first appeared in the literature during the 80s. In 1987, in a study by uh, Dr. Mombelli, the disease periimplantitis with quotation marks was described as an infectious disease with many features common to periodontitis. 
let us say um, uh, you carry out an examination uh, on a new patient at the clinic, um, and the patient has some discomfort at four or five. As you can see, a problem has occurred. What do you think? Could this have been prevented? So this is the first question. Of, um, so in, in the top of your mind, what would your answer be? Could this have been prevented? So I thought just to, and I will launch it to you. So please tick a box, uh, and I will then share all the result with all of us. Um, if somebody promised to tick a box, uh, it's because you have a full screen. Thank you for taking part. I can see at least 40% of you have ticked the box now. Thank you so much for sharing, and I will soon close it. And I will share it with you. So, yes, nice. Most likely, yes, exactly. And as, a, as we all have a as you can see it, the picture again. Yeah, and as we also, a lot of plaque uh, accumulation at the buccal site. So, maybe in this case, it's not so obvious why a uh, problem. It, it looks as the patient has fairly uh, good plaque control, uh, at least uh, when taking this photo. Uh, we know that perimpatitis is a very complex disease and risk factors are, uh, many risk factors are involved, which I will touch upon uh, today when I talk about implant maintenance. So, uh, as you know, I'm sitting here at the TP headquarters in Malmö uh, with my two screens. Uh, so it would be very nice to know who you are. Uh, feel free to answer, uh, but nice for me to know if it's mostly a student, dentist, dental hygienist, or a mix. I will um, so please tick a box if you would like to. Thank you for sharing. I can see you are ticking a box. Thank you so much, and I will soon close it again. As we can see, mostly dental hygienists, some dentists, and students. Well, that's a really a nice mix because, uh, as you can see, this is really a teamwork how to keep these patients uh, healthy. Thank you so much. And I will hide it again. Yes, it's working. So we continue. So, and um, since uh, mostly you are uh, professionally working, you know this, but I will oh, anyway go through it. How does the disease uh, develop? As you know, mucositis is caused by plaque accumulation um, on the implant along with the gum. Lung. And usually more pronounced inflammatory response in the peri-implant mucosa compared with the inflammatory response in the gingiva around the teeth. That is more bleeding, but also less amount of plaque is needed to establish an inflammation around uh, implants. At this stage, as you know, the disease is mostly reversible if the patient starts to clean thoroughly. But if the plaque is not removed, the inflammation will increase, and in time, the bone around the implant will start to break down. The mucositis has developed into peri-implantitis. And without treatment, the loss, uh, bone loss and inflammation will uh, continue. And the implant may eventually have to be removed. Sometimes the progression goes fast. Inflammation uh, around implants is very common among our patients. This review shows that somewhere between 18 to 74 percent of all patients with implants will get problems with peri-implant mucositis. 
And as you can see, prevalence figure differs between the studies due to different definition of disease, follow up time, and so on. How many will be affected by peri implantitis then on patient level? And this review concludes that nearly up to one third of patients will get peri implantitis. And onset of peri implantitis occur early during follow up. And that was shown in a nine year follow up study from DERPS in Sweden. Another study in Sweden was conducted with a follow up of 20 years. And this study shows up another interesting thing implant losses occurred at the first few years of the implantation. Uh, the study also confirmed that crystal bone loss around implants in the absence of clinical signs of soft tissue inflammation is a rare event. So it seems like important to take good care of the implants as soon as they are placed in the mouth. So which are the host risk factors for implant diseases? And listed are some of the risk factors. Bacterial uh, infection due to plaque accumulation is the etiological factor for the disease but seems to be a multifactorial disease where other factors contribute to the development. Then there are some risk factors that we as dental profession should consider before and during and then after treatment. In many steps, there are pitfalls. Visiting the dental office on a regular basis of the implant placement seems to be a crucial factor for implant success. And which are the strongest risk factors for mucositis when summarizing studies? From the World Workshop AAP and EFP on the classification of periodontal and periimplant diseases, we can learn that there is a strong evidence that mucositis is caused by plaque. And potential risk factors are these. So as we know, periimplantitis carries as an inflammatory process in the peri-implant connective tissue and progressive bone loss. So what is AFP and EFP writing concerning periimplantitis when summarizing studies? Strong evidence that there is an increased risk for peri-implantitis in patients who have poor plaque control skills, no regular maintenance care, and a history of periodontitis. Both smoking and diabetes show inclusive evidence as risk factors though, and limited evidence for these other potential risk factors when looking at published studies. So, um, so I thought uh, one more question. Uh, do you treat um, implant patients often or seldom? So let's take another question. Please tick a box if you would like to. Thank you. I can see 25% uh, of you take the box. Thank you so much for taking part. And I will soon close this. And I will share it with you. So we can see once a week, several days a week. Well, that's nice. So it's a mix here as well with those who have more experience and less experience. And I hope this presentation will in some way uh, be of value for you. I will hide it again. Yes, so it's working. So uh, treatment of mucositis then. Uh, mechanical I have to put this arrow here. So uh, mechanical biofilm control is the standard care of management, that is to eliminate biofilm with 
with environment uh, an optimal plaque control and individual main care, and mostly it is reversible. And as you know, reversal of the clinical signs of inflammation around indus may take longer than three weeks. Treatment of periimplantitis. So, which mechanical instruments should we use for treatment of um, mucositis and periimplantitis? Well, three choices do we have according to the consensus report, and seems like the same efficacy according to studies. Uh, what is the effectiveness of non-surgical treatment in mucositis? Treatment will result in uh, 15 to 40 percent reduction in bleeding on probing, and for periimplantitis, usually reducing bleeding by 20 to 50 percent. So there are effects of non-surgical treatment, but as you can see, no complete resolution of the disease is unlikely. And there is no golden standards on how to treat periimplantitis, as shown in this article. This article is presenting an overview of treatment options. Many approaches, but always start with non-surgical therapy, since it may counteract periimplantitis progression before moving on to surgery. And when it comes to surgery, there are also different options. And uh, the authors are um, writing um, to prevent relapse, regular maintenance appointment, also focusing on this. And there is no consensus on how to treat periimplantitis. No therapy seems to be superior. As the outcome therapy of periimplantitis is still considered unpredictable, it appears crucial to focus on prevention, which means that patients should attend a maintenance program. But do our patients attend maintenance care? This survey from Michigan, US, 135 patients measuring the knowledge, attitudes among those who had implants installed in the mouth. Uh, a result from an anonymous questionnaire. Only 52% of patients were aware of the importance of proper maintenance intervals in order for implants to stay healthy. And 20% never went for implant maintenance. And this study highlighting the false perception that dental implants are more resilient and require less care than natural teeth. And as we know, it's the opposite. So I thought we'd take uh, one more question. Yeah, what would you say um, when, uh, when I was looking at the study I just showed with 20% never attend and 50% no, it should, they should go. What would you say? Oh, thank you. Would be very interested to see. Thank you. I can see at least 40% of you have ticked the box. And I will close it now and share it. So uh, I can see. As you also can see, mostly 20 to 50 and 50 to 80. And all, also some asking, almost all patients attend. That's perfect. Um, and it varies. Now, I have no idea from which country uh, uh, you are, but I must say, even in Sweden, where we have a very favorable reimbursement system, it might be tricky to enroll all patients uh, into a maintenance program. So I'm happy to see uh, those figures. So we continue. Uh, look at this case with the mucosal dehesions. 
some of you might think that a patient will call the office when something looks or feels strange. A newly published study from Spain revealed something very interesting. This study was looking at clinical signs, uh, symptoms, perception, and quality of life in patients suffering from peri-implant diseases. Even in case of peri-implantitis, nearly 90% of the implants were perceived by the patients as healthy. So peri-implantitis is in many cases asymptomatic and may not be perceived by the patients. So may not call us as we would like them to do. And this is a famous study from Brazil that confirms the importance of maintenance care. A study with a five-year follow-up with or without preventive maintenance care. So 212 partially dental individuals. And five years later, 80 individuals who had been diagnosed with mucositis in the baseline examination were re-examined. And these individuals were divided into two groups, one group with preventive maintenance during the study period and one without maintenance. And what did this study show? Well, we can see without maintenance, 44% of the patients were diagnosed with peri-implantitis. So this study really shows the importance of preventive maintenance. And this is a study from Germany. What makes this study interesting is that the study is conducted at a normal private practice, not a university clinic, and looking at the long-term impact of maintenance care on peri-implant diseases. So roughly 50 consecutive patients with 100 implants had attended a maintenance program for more than uh, six years. And the second consecutive group included patients without compliance that didn't come, con the control group. So pockets, uh, probing depth, uh, bleeding on probing, bone loss, and hygiene, implant hygiene were assessed. So what did this study show? Uh, in the maintenance group, because the mucositis rate 30%, periplantitis 4%, and in the control group, those without maintenance, we see mucositis rate raised to 68%, and periimplantitis 70%. So the results uh, also uh, show that in the maintenance group, 25% of the implants showed positive plaque values compared to 61% of the implants in the control group. So conclusions, patient without regular maintenance might exhibit a fourfold increased risk for peri-implantitis and therefore supportive implant therapy program should be a part of implant treatment. Yeah, as we know. Uh, and then a very common question is recall visit, how often then? And there is, of course, no consensus on ideal interval of maintenance care since it must be tailored individually, depending on patients, um, yeah, uh, different systemic diseases, and yeah, a lot of risk factors, you know. But from the review, we can learn that less peripatitis with uh, maintenance more than twice a year. So, and now implant maintenance at home at the clinic. And I will talk about implant maintenance during the remaining part of my presentation, besides going through uh, these steps. Uh, when seeing a patient, uh, we need to check the medication taken and take a, look, a closer look, of course, at the prosthetic construction as well. And I will start with uh, diagnosis. Uh, during a maintenance visit, uh, diagnostic assessment should include the following. Uh, and these measurements should be carried out at um, the appointment on implants and on teeth. 
and in, it will give us valuable information. And of course, as you know, no pockets should be deeper than six millimeter on teeth. So check all all the teeth and implants in the mouth, and always compare today's information with previous uh, examination data. And does the tissue look healthy? Yeah, here we can see a swelling, redness, and as you can see, bleeding on probing. Uh, so mucositis is um, bleeding when gentle probing, swelling, redness, and um, could be with or without uh, pockets, absence of bonus. And the patient may have some bleeding sensitivity or bad taste. Periimplantitis then, bleeding again, redness, edema, increased pocket depth and additional bone loss. And the patient may have some discomfort, bleeding, uh, or even discover mobility. And teach the patient gingival bleeding, contact the clinic at once. But as I showed you uh, earlier, not so obvious for a patient that problem has occurred. That's why it's so important that they come to us for the maintenance program. So for a diagnosis, a visual inspection, and more important to look for signs of inflammation than how many millimeter depth. It is necessary to probe perimplant tissue to assess the presence of bleeding and probing and to monitor probing pocket depth changes. We can use a met metal probe, but better to use a flexible plastic probe uh, in case of um, tulip-shaped uh, crowns. Um, and, and if hard to probe uh, due to the construction, uh, simply run your finger along the tissue to see if any separation will occur. And measurements should be taken by the dentist at baseline when the final construction is being placed. So we have a value to compare with later on at checkups. And you might easily penetrate into the connected tissue of an implant if using too much force. It is hard to know when using the correct pressure for probing, 0.2 Newton, but very light probing compared to probing teeth. Good to be aware of is that usually deeper pockets at implant sides versus teeth and the papilla at the proximal sides of an implant may be shorter compared to a tooth. I think it's appropriate to take an x-ray once a year or even at the appointment in between if something has occurred. An x-ray will provide us with a lot of information, not only bone level. So inspect the abutment screw, the fit of the construction, uh, the implant, and so on. And combine this information with the visual inspection of the superstructure and the tissue. After all uh, measurements taken, can you tick the box a healthy implant? How to define peri-implant health? To be able to diagnose peri-implant health, these four clinical definitions should be fulfilled. Visual inspection, healthy tissue, no bleeding or separation on gentle probing, no increase in probing depth, and absence of bone loss. The second uh, bullet point, uh, professional uh, cleaning, mechanical cleaning, this should be carried out at every appointment, of course, and you all know how to do it, even though I guess using different tools. Now, moving on to risk factors. And in the beginning of the presentation, I showed several risk factors for peri-implant diseases, patient-related, and I mentioned risk factors that we, dental profession, are in some way responsible for. And I would like to focus on some. One risk factor is 
accessibility. And this is a Swedish study looking at accessibility of restoration. The uh, examination showed that plaque and gingival um, bleeding above 30%, and that is far too much. But when reading the study, you can learn that the majority of patients had relatively good plaque control in the residual dentition, but not at implant site. In 74% of implants, no accessibility to proper oral hygiene, a lot of plaque accumulation. And what did the result show concerning the patient with perimplantitis? Smoking. Here we can see no so much difference, but that could be due to very few smokers in this Swedish study. Um, Perimplantitis then. A few sites with excess for oral hygiene were affected 4%, while 48% of non-cleansable sites showed perimplantitis. The results of the study indicate that local factors such as accessibility for oral hygiene at the implant sites seem to be related to the presence or absence of periimplantitis. Yeah, and an awful example of no uh, accessibility. The patient had no possibility to clean around the implants in this screw retained bridge. A lot of fast marginal bone loss. And the question was if any of the implants could be saved. Superstructure should be designed in a way that facilitates sufficient access for regular diagnosis by probing, as well as for personal and professional oral hygiene measures. Please make sure that the patient can easily clean all surfaces of the implant, as seen here. And another example of a well-designed construction. And this screw retained construction will be very easy for the patient to clean daily. And a tip is to send an interdental rush to, to your technician and to write very clear instructions. Um, yeah, and I, I have left out a section, uh, the section I usually include about cementation since Dr. Martin Yanda talked about this at our clinical symposium last week. You who are listening today are from different parts of the world. Uh, it will be quite interesting to know if you mostly do um, uh, screw retained or cemented. I will launch it. Um, there are pros and cons of this. Um, now please tick a box if you would like to. It would be interested to see. Uh, now I realize there are many hygienists here, so maybe, but you can tick anyway if you know what you mostly do at your clinic. So thank you so much. I can see 25%, uh, 40% did tick a box. Please, it would be very interesting. Um, can I close it? So we can see, uh, oh yeah, mostly I don't do, yeah, I realize. But at least screw retain is the most common and that's very nice because it's easier. Thank you so much. It's a really a trend, I think, worldwide to um, ask for screw retain. So I will hide it again. Some more, um, risk factors. From the guides from the European Federation of Perantology, we can learn that smoking should be eliminated and treatment of perantal diseases must proceed in plant placement. A patient should have good plaque control before implant installation. And here, I think all dental hygienists have a very, very uh, important um, thing to motivate, never come to it uh, and encourage our patient to have, because of that we have much better success rate. And the goal is, as you can see below, 10%. That's very hard. Uh, and no residual pockets, of course, should be there and bleeding a problem below 10%. Um, 
and we should also inform the patient about the need to attend uh, regular maintenance care and how important the daily thorough cleaning is um, and of course um, talk about the risk for peri-implant diseases and Im implants as we know require more attention than teeth so reinstruction and we must check plaque levels and reinstruct our patients in oral hygiene at every appointment what really matters is the daily cleaning at home how should the patient clean their implant construction which tools to suggest all surfaces along the gum line of an implant should be cleaned daily and there are different special tools available for cleaning implant construction and it is important that we dental professionals are aware of what to recommend and i will go through some products that will facilitate for your patient the daily cleaning at home and if uh, your patient have um, this kind of screw retained bridge then implant orthodontic brush is the obvious choice with this slim brush head only two rows the patient will be able to clean along the gum line on the buccal sides with a normal wider toothbrush that narrow surface will not be efficiently cleaned and reached implant crowns may be tulip shaped and for many patients hard to reach the lingual gingival margin with a normal toothbrush. Universal Care has a small brush head with long filaments, which facilitates to reach the area where the crown meets the mucosa, as shown in the slide. The brush has a unique bendable neck. Uh, use hot water from the tab and customized angulation of the brush for your patient if needed. And this uh, angle brush compact tuft with a dense rounded tuft is ideal for precision in cleaning along the gum line, cleaning visible threads, also suitable cleaning around bars and cleaning attachment in a denture. And as you might know, this brush is very suitable for all ages and in many different conditions. Another um, choice for some patients with implants might be interspace which has a tapered brush tip for optimal access in difficult to reach areas and the brush has changeable tips with different textures and mechanical cleaning of the denture should be done every day as we know, only using chemical agents is not enough to keep a healthy mucosa. And denture care has extra long, strong filaments to ensure good accessibility and efficient cleaning. And the brush is designed to resemble a conventional toothbrush and then the handle for improved grip and access. And what to recommend after surgery or for patient with extremely sore tissue. Special, special care has ultra soft filaments, always red, also available in the compact version, which always is blue. So toothbrushing, whether manual or electrical, is not enough. And the tooth uh, has five surfaces as we know and with a toothbrush you will only reach three of them that is 60 percent of the surfaces and you won't access the important surfaces between the teeth where periodontitis most often starts and cleaning between teeth and implants should be included in the daily oral care routine of every adult and even more important if patient has implants since the tissue is more, much, much more sensitive to plaque accumulation. Here showing incidental brushes, cleaning the proximal area of implants. 
And how to carry out optimal cleaning is obvious for us, but not for a patient. Many patients don't know how to use an interdental brush and feel unsecure. And we need to practice a lot with our patients. Uh, when instructing the patient, it is also a good opportunity to check if there is accessibility for cleaning around the implant surface or not. And there are nine eye sizes. The smallest interdental brush has a passage hole diameter of 0 0.6 millimeter. So very, very tiny. And the neck should be bent on the four smaller sizes, not the wire, for better accessibility in posterior teeth and longer durability. On the bigger sizes, bend the wire instead. And, and if not optimal cleaning space, make sure to adjust the prosthetic construction. And keep it angle is another option for interdental cleaning, longer handle and pre-angled. For me as a clinician, I would say uh, some features are more important than others when choosing an interdental brush. Uh, the filament coverage is one. Uh, the filament should cover as much as possible of the wire to avoid trauma from the wire at the gingiva or to the tooth and implant. An ergonomic handle to uh, have good control when doing the forth and back movements. But I also like that TP offers brushes in all nine ISO sizes because then it's easy to move up and down in sizes. And the last feature I would like to highlight is the plastic coated wire. On all brushes in, in TP collections, the wire is covered with plastic. So smoother feeling when used for teeth and no scratches on implants. For patients with very sensitive uh, mucosa around the implants, has very little keratinized mucosa, uh, or patients with less saliva or very sensitive teeth, these extra soft brushes should be recommended. Six sizes, as you can see, and the color coded sizes correspond to the original range, but in paler colors could also be used by those who just prefer a softer toothbrush, a softer brush. And for some uh, clinical uh, situation, a bridge and implant floss with a sponge part and stiff ends could be an option, or also a complement to interdental brushes. Uh, depending on the design on the superstructure, uh, this might be a suitable tool to recommend. For example, when there is a ridge lab, like those mushroom-shaped crowns, uh, cleaning under uh, bridges, or for cleaning very narrow proximal spaces. Uh, one time use though, because when implant threads are visible, better recommend an interdental brush since floss may fray when cleaning implant threads and leave remnants in the tissue. Another complementary product might be a water flosser. It is very technique sensitive to achieve plaque removal in the proximal impatient with implants and with wider spaces, since too little pressure there, unless skillful and leaning measly and distally at every proximal space. I believe this product may be beneficial as a complement to incidental brushes removing large deposits prior to uh, interdental brushes or to the bridge and implant floss. And for patients with limited ability to perform adequate oral hygiene. Another complementary product is this modern toothpick. Uh, TP EasyPick is covered with silicone, a very comfortable material in the mouth, the same materials in Pacifius. A perfect on-the-go product during the day, but for the proper cleaning in the evening, I would definitely recommend an interdental brush. Sometimes you need an antibacterial agent, and to apply it uh, locally is convenient. TP uh, gingival gel contains both chlorhexidine and fluoride, 
And as you can see, free from colors, uh, color and braces, easily applied with an incidental brush or compact touch using the lid of the bottle. So to summarize this section of instruction, uh, customized self-care instruction should be given to the patient based on implant design, accessibility for cleaning, and patient's dexterity. How to instruct, uh, you show the patient, and then the patient shows you. And practice at every uh, appointment with your patient and check if the tools you discussed at the previous session fits its purpose and if the cleaning technique might be improved. I can see the time. I only have some few slides left and I will talk on motivating education. Sorry, I, um, yeah, for the delay here, but. I move on then. Uh, so what really matters is the daily cleaning at home that will make the difference, health or disease. Uh, so what I would like to quick just show what the patient knows. Um, and a good way to increase this, of course, I will talk about motivation interviewing, and I guess we all try to practice it daily. About knowledge, I would say from this study, from other study, we can learn that patients have a very low level of knowledge and quality of life is impaired when, um, when they have the disease. And also here, see most patients have no knowledge of peri-implant pathology. Therefore, uh, also the author is writing that uh, inform with brochures to educate patients on risk factors and indicators for the disease. And TIP has very nice patient lists um, for different disease uh, conditions. Um, so one way I can put on the camera anyway. So, uh, so one another way uh, to increase uh, the knowledge is we can see how do we learn I put here. So only 5% um, what we hear, but as you can see, 75% if we practice doing so. That's one way, easy way to increase knowledge, learning with our patients is to practice with them. And uh, the last uh, slide is please listen to Sarah, uh, Swedish uh, dental hygienist. And the question was to her, as you can see, what do you think, why do you think you succeed in motivating your patient? And this is the last one. And I hope this will work. The patients uh, that love coming to me are the patients I uh, connect very well with um, on a personal level as well as on a professional level. Um, I treat them with respect, but also with a lot of sense of humor, and we laugh a lot together, and uh, I sing for them. Maybe not sing for, I sing to them as well, sometimes. And I, 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 I don't know, we laugh a lot. And it's a, it's a, it's a fun hour that we spend together. the patient that's really nice to hear uh, so so um, please send questions to me i can see there are some questions thank you and i will answer them uh, soon and before taking a look, closer look at the question i'd like to mention to you tp share a place to be informed inspired and educated tp share will bring you tutorials or audio research webinars and much more so please uh, go to tpshare.com. Uh, for those of you who missed our very nice clinical symposium last week on implants, perio, and diabetes, it's still possible for you for some more days for you to see this uh, recorded version at tpshare.com. So I will take a look at uh, some questions. So thank you. I can see there are some questions here and I will uh, answer some of them. Um, 
trainer of mucositis. Oh, now I have more questions. I have to check here. Uh, it's about also detection of perimplantitis and uh, mucositis and also, yeah, thank you. Um, and I must say it might be tricky to differ if it's mucositis or perimplantitis, even though we know that uh, perimplantitis, it should be progressive bone loss. Uh, and uh, also when you look at the x-ray, progressive bone loss and increased pro probing pocket depth. But it's hard, as I showed you, when you use the probe to have the right pressure. And I'm also very careful that you use um, the same instrument. If you you should use the plastic probe, stick to that uh, to have the right pressure. And sometimes it's in between. But I would say, um, if you're unsecure, it will be the same treatment anyway. Uh, you do a uh, professional cleaning thoroughly and um, and a very good instruction for what m will make the difference is, as I've told you, is what the patient do at home. It's the thoroughly cleaning and instructing them to clean all surfaces of the implant and to find tools that uh, will help them to uh, disturb uh, the plaque levels. Um, so, uh, yeah, and there's one also, uh, hygienist is asking, um, the dentist sometimes designs the superstructure, so it's impossible for me as a hygienist to perform professional clean. This is a situation hard to handle. Oh, I can, I agree with you totally. And that's why it's very nice um, to see the trend towards screw retained construction because then it's easy or should be easy to remove the construction and to uh, do the adjustment for uh, better accessibility. Uh, but you must um, talk with a dentist and try to adjust because if you can't have a thoroughly cleaning, it will be a problem, mostly. Uh, and um, so, yeah, please check it and discuss it with the dentists who have done the construction. Thank you so much for the questions. Maybe one more. Um, yes, yeah, so also one question about uh, the implant, the design. Um, yeah, as I said, um, it's a very good tip to send uh, the interdental brush to the technician when you order um, your construction. And usually I try to be in the middle because it is easier for patient to handle uh, the yellow or green, those colors, isocytes that are in the middle, then a very tiny one. And I send uh, the yellow one, and then I ask the technician to have the same uh, space between all bridges if it's no aesthetic uh, problem. Then it will be much easier. And also if there is only one implant, maybe it should be the same space as adjacent teeth. But it is individual. But think how to make it easier for the patient to do the daily cleaning at home. Thank you so much for attending this uh, webinar. And uh, don't forget to go to TP Share and uh, uh, maybe register for this clinical symposium and look for other things, interesting things. Have a nice day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.